everyone. What a rousing entrance that was from the Jazz Sanctuary. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And fitting for a celebration of life, such as we are here today to celebrate Ev. The sorrow and joy of life weaves a tapestry over this blessed community as we gather to remember his life to remember all he was from the many walks of his life, we set aside our own lives to know and to, farewell, to say farewell the one we have loved. And here we also come to search for life's deepest meanings, the meanings that come from the comfort of healing, companionship, and love. At this time, we are one with the wisdom and customs of all ages. Together, we here are in the embrace of an ageless human communion. Our strength and our hope is great, for both come from that deep well of humanity that knows that although death can, may come, it is a life lived that is far more important. I'm going to light our chalice. But not with that. And I offer these words from the Hindu poet Tagore. Peace, my heart. Let the time for parting be sweet. Let it not be a death, but a completeness. Let love melt into memory and pain into songs. Let the flight through the sky end in the folding of the wings over the nest. I have officiated at many memorial services in my life, but I think this is the first time that we welcome a jazz group, and that is so very fitting for Ev. I am thrilled that the Jazz Sanctuary is with us today, 
They are known to many of us as that group which has done so much to keep jazz alive in the Philadelphia area. Ev, who had been coming to this church since 1978, loved jazz. And so it is his love that we celebrate his life with. This great American form of music, this unique fusion that has rocked the world, this genre of jazz brings together not only his memories, but all of us into a community. And we are here today to celebrate his life, and I hope as you're listening to the music, you will let that feeling and those memories of Ev flow through your heart. We welcome the Jazz Sanctuary as they play these numbers.
fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, darling, kiss me. song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. Let's hear it again for the band Leon Jordan on drums. <laughs> Eddie Ekins on sax, clarinet, and flute. Randy Sutton on vibes and percussion. And James Delaforce on piano. Peter New on trumpet. And Alan Siegel on bass. I don't even know where to go from here. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and thank you all for being here. It's a time now where we're going to uh, move a little bit to memories. And of course, there's so much to the, that be, could be said about Ev's life. He's a Navy pilot. He worked in government. He's business. He taught his family, the, the many friends that he had. All of that life is so rich, and many of you know that life, and uh, if you don't, you should look it up in the Philadelphia Inquirer, because it's quite something. What I really want to do now is shift a little bit and hear from all of you. So I'm going to ask Wynne Newman to come up first and lead off in these remembrances, and then after Wynne is done, if you just raise your hand, one of the ushers will bring you a microphone and we have some time to share some memories. So we'll ask Wynne to come forward. Well, I want to end to do my service. Um, Ev was my friend and mentor for 39 years. Uh, naval aviator with 800 carrier landings, a Wharton MBA, McKinsey consultant, fire to the president's uh, office of management and budget, undersecretary of the Air Force for finance, dean of Wharton, true master at finance and organization, and the list goes on. But his long list of titles, boards, accolades was founded on Ev's extraordinary life love of the challenge of new ideas and people on a mission um, 
everything from business startups and value creation to adopted sports programs for the handicapped. Ev brought to life <coughs> uh, the dreams and passions of inventors, entrepreneurs, and people in need. I met <coughs> Ann and Ev at a party at Gail Lawson's, 1985. Uh, my wife, Lanny, was in conversation with Ann on the su subject of airplanes and my struggling startup technology company uh, came up and they both immediately went and got Ev and me together. Uh, we started talking about flying and business, or love of airplanes, invention, strategies, startups, and Wharton. Uh, to my shock, Ev asked me for a job. And uh, I said, Lord, I can't hire the dean of Wharton, uh, but let's, let's be partners. So that started our friendship of 39 years. It took me a while to understand the scope of Ev's background. Uh, a year later, we were at a conference in Anaheim, California, and the hotels were all full, so we ended up uh, at the Disneyland Hotel, and there were hundreds of parents and children. And um, we went down for breakfast, and he left for a moment, and the head waiter came running over with a telephone trailing a long cord. This is 1986. And uh, urgent call from Mr. Keach. It's the White House. <laughs> and he handed me the phone. So... Uh, <laughs> The man on the other end said, have to have Keach on the phone now. And uh, in the background, I hear, could hear Ronald Reagan <coughs> uh, yelling, get Keach, get Keach. So thankfully, Ev came back to the table. And uh, the call was about recruiting Ev to be Secretary of the Army for R&D uh, to correct another uh, brewing crisis. Um, I remember him describing Frank Piasecki, who was one of the uh, big pioneers, there were three pioneers of helicopters in this country, and Frank appeared in his office at Wharton with an idea for a revolutionary new aircraft. You take a, your basic 400-foot Navy blimp, add a metal skeleton and four large helicopters to make a vehicle capable of a 100,000-pound vertical lift. Ev got to work and raised uh, $26 million from the Forest Service, and the Helistat was born. A uh, magnificent aircraft. I actually flew the chase plane on it during test flights in, over the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. And um, unfortunately, it was brought down by a tiny fall in the steering dampers on the landing gear. But uh, it was a true breakthrough. And, um, and Ev was like that. He would take something that was completely out of the box and make it ha help make it happen. Ev brought to our startup technology company Mission Focus financial structure controls his master class in negotiation. Uh, early on, he and I traveled up to Pratt & Whitney, one of the major manufacturers of jet engines, uh, to negotiate a contract to develop a new technology to test jet engine parts vital to our company's survival. Uh, I was shocked when Ev told them we needed an amount five times more than I estimated. And the negotiations ended immediately with smiles as they said, Mr. Keach, we're greatly relieved uh, you didn't ask for too little. <laughs> and of course he was right. Um, uh, and on the way home, we stopped also, of course, at the Aviation Museum at the Hartford Airport. And, uh, and going through the exhibits, he found his old airplane, this uh, AD from the America uh, in the museum. Meticulous pilot, he managed aircraft for several friends and thought of nothing of redesigning the control panel with all digital screens, creating a perfect instrument layout. His Navy, Navy stories were epic. Uh, night launches from uh, the Enterprise over the Mediterranean to escort the King of Greece during the military coup d'etat of December 1967. We're about the catapult launch uh, with the uh, fuel boost pump switched off. And immediately, this fuel all sloshed to the back of the tank. The engine died and uh, <clears throat> from st fuel starvation as he headed for the wave tops. He switched on the boost pump. The engine fired uh, as soon as just a mere feet above the ocean, a subject of much ribbing for years from his wingman, John McCain. In his role in government, Ev had strongly supported the need for and the funding of the space shuttle, a fact not lost on the people at NASA we worked with at the Cape. He loved going down to uh, meet with shuttle managers and watch launches, 
and we were there in 1998 when John Glenn made his flight, return flight to space. Ev was uh, delighted in the last months of his life um, that we won a major contract to support <coughs> NASA's return to the moon. His extraordinary skills and his faith in people impacted many lives. But Ev's true legacy is his deep love for his country, for Anne, his children, and grandchildren. He was devoted and loyal to his friends and <clears throat> all those who had the privilege to uh, work with him. Thank you. Thank you, Wynne. And now we will hear from you the stories of the lives. Uh, I've got one over here. The rushers will bring a microphone. Good, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Frank Rappaport, proud to uh, have been a friend of Ebb's. Uh, first, Anne, love you. You're amazing. Will, go Phillies. Wynn Newman, that was fantastic. Um, Wynn and Lanny and I knew each other from Wayne, and Wynn was always talking about this guy, Ev Keach. He says, you got to meet him. I said, okay. He says, yeah, he was secretary, under secretary of the Air Force. He solved so many problems. He knows people you know in Washington at the Pentagon. And I say to Will, well, what about congressmen? He says, oh, yeah, he knows them too. So, of course, we had a meeting. And I was immediately struck by not who people thought he was, but who he was, the warmth and the humility. And it was only later that he called me and he said, Frank, I'd like you to help me with a legal matter at the Defense Department. I went, whoa. I go home to my wife, I said, Everett Keach has asked me to help him. Now you have to realize lawyers don't often brag about their clients. In fact, you know, clients don't brag about their lawyers. Um, but Ed was the type that if I would go out for dinner with he and Anne with a new lady friend, on cue, Ev would start to say, oh, Frank did this for me, and Frank did this, and I was embarrassed, but of course I loved it, and it <laughs> maybe kept the relationship going another week, who knows. Um, you know, most people, when they have hobbies, they collect things like stamps, art, whatever. Ev collected airplanes. Now, leave it to him to find an astronaut to run his company. And I would say, Ev, where do you get these airplanes? He said, ah, oh, they're around. And I said, well, who do you sell them to? He said, well, I train pilots and often sell to the Israelis and, and others. I said, you know, that, that's amazing. Um, one day, um, we were in Washington for a meeting, and it was dinner time. And I said, hey, Ev, let's go to Georgetown. Let's kick around and, you know, have dinner. He said, no, I'm going to take you somewhere else. And I said, where? He said, I'm going to take you to the Cosmos Club. So we get to the front of this edifice. Unbelievable. I said, Ev, I thought you had to be a Nobel laureate or something like that to get in. He winked. We went in and had dinner. <laughs> um, so I came across something in closing I wanted to read, made me think about Ev. It's by Robert Burns. It's a, called An Epitaph to a Friend. An honest man lies at rest, the friend of man, the friend of truth, the friend of age and guide of youth. Few hearts like his with virtue warmed, few heads with knowledge so informed. If there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there's none, he made the best of this. Is the microphone on? 
Okay, great. So, right here. Hello. I'm uh, Tucker Taylor, and that is Thorne Burbank Taylor sitting right there. The Taylors and the Keeches go back, we may be talking pre Bee Gees here. That's how long we've known each other. <laughs> And we've done so many things together and had so many good times, it's hard to isolate a memory of Everett without the wonderful, magnificent Annie being in the same picture. But I did think of two boy-on-boy -boy, uh, memories with Everett that I'd like to share with you, if you don't mind. And Wynn has alluded to one of them. Um, number one, um, when he and I were on the aircraft carrier in the, in the uh, Mediterranean Sea, we would occasionally interrupt the party to actually fly missions. And on, and on one such day, I was not flying, but there was Ev sitting on catapult number two, waiting for a routine launch, astride his nine-ton angry belch-fire war machine. Uh, and um, it was routine. There had been 400 such launches that day, and Wynn has alluded to it. So, as I look around, there may be some people here who don't, don't understand how an aircraft catapult works. So, I'm take a, let me take a moment to explain. So, the pilot taxis the airplane onto the catapult until restrained by something called a holdback fitting. A holdback fitting connects the back of the airplane to the flight deck, and is machined to break at a certain tension. The pilot feels that restraint, goes to full power, trying to get as much juice out of the machine as you can. That sets up a huge racket, incredible vibration caused by the tension of pulling and holding. Um, the pilot looks around, checks some stuff. If everything looks okay, gives a Jesus take the wheel salute to the catapult officer who in turn looks down to make sure there's nothing in the way, fires the catapult, the pressure builds, the whole back fitting breaks, and the airplane scoots on down, accelerating it through the 300 feet on its way to the wild blue yonder. It's easy, it's routine, it's fun, unless, of course, at the very beginning of that catapult sequence, the engine quits, which is precisely what happened to Lieutenant Keach that day. So I and a couple hundred others were watching these flight operations, and we saw in horror, with our hearts in our throat, as this nine tons of lifeless machinery in dead silence was dragged down the catapult. About halfway down, the engine sputtered and began to it began to kick over, and then as the airplane left the catapult, it still wasn't up to 100%, but through a masterful piece of airmanship, Everett managed to wrangle this thing up into the air and flew off over the horizon on whatever the hell his mission was that day. Um, what technically happened, as one pointed out, is something, who knows what, interrupted the flow from the fuel tank to the engine. No gas, no go. But then the massive inertia of this catapult shot forced the fuel up into the manifolds, the engine started, thus saving the day, not to mention Ever Keach's young ass. <laughs> it, as, as pilots are wont to do, we joked and laughed about this for months. But in fact, in truth, it was really terrifying. It was a really scary event. Um, the second was, as you all know, Everett taught a night course at University of Pennsylvania for several years. Uh, this was not child's play. These students were postgraduates going to advanced degrees in business economics, statistics, computer science. Um, on a couple occasions, Everett invited me to participate in this classroom, and that experience, from that experience, I've got two takeaways. Number one, the byplay with these sophisticated students showed exactly how really smart Everett Keach was, 
how quick on his feet, how razor sharp. The second takeaway has to do with human relationships. Everett didn't try to make these students feel important. He made them important. It's a big distinction. Making someone feel important is egocentric, it's kind of cynical, but making them important is critical. So in his platonic worldview, Everett saw these people as important as he was. And students felt that, understood it, reacted to it, and what happened was magic moments. Some really cool shit came about because of it. So um, I think Everett Taylor Keach loved to teach. I think it might have been a part of who he was. So I join you all in missing him terribly. Just to follow that up, uh, I was a doctorate student health in the early 70s, and uh, the students would come in. I would get blood pressures of 180 over 120 when they arrived, and then they would go down. And I realized the stress that these kids were under. They were all so competitive. The whole atmosphere was competitive. What I watched over time when Ev came, I didn't know Ev at the time, I only knew Ann. I didn't know about F. The mood of Wharton started changing, and it was Ev's influence, his humanity, just what you were saying. Um, it just, thank heavens, he arrived and changed that mood of business to caring as well as brilliance. comfortable up here behind something, so. Um, I'm Allison Sanka, formerly known as Ali Keach. Many of you know me at that. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I just want to thank you for joining us today to celebrate my dad. Um, I'm really, really thankful to see all of you here today as we come together to remember him. So it's really heartwarming to see friends from so many eras of my life to uh, here today. Uh, Dad lived a remarkable and impressive life, as you've heard, valuing hard work and achievement. He thrived on connecting people and the challenge of business deals. And these are things that I wrote before anybody else spoke today, so you'll hear that, that theme rolling through here again and again. You probably all read his obituary and the wonderful story in the Philadelphia Inquirer by Gary Miles. If you haven't, you really should. Uh, there are things in there that I had forgotten about or maybe didn't even know I had forgotten about the Department of Energy, you know, starting up the Department of Energy, that little thing <laughs> in the 70s. Um, so the headlines are always about his career and his political accomplishments, but I'm really here to talk about the other side of him how even though he worked a lot and it became a family joke that he was always late because he needed to just make one more phone call before we left somewhere, he was still my dad. Um, like many men of his generation, his love language was being a provider, making sure we had what we needed, and he was great at that. I grew up in a beautiful home with everything that I needed. That included a top-notch education and graduating with no student loans, so I wanna thank you, mom and dad, for that. Um, only recently I learned that this may have come at some sacrifice, but he never let on that it was stressful or that it couldn't happen. He told me a story, even late in his life, about how he was admitted to Cornell and couldn't afford to go because there wasn't an ROTC scholarship available. There was one at University of Rochester, which ended up being a great experience for him, 
but he never forgot that he got in but couldn't afford the Ivy League school. One of his goals was to put all three kids through college with no loans, and he made sure that happened. Being a parent of a son about ready to embark on this journey uh, at double the price, mind you, <laughs> I'm even more grateful for this gift, which changed the trajectory of my life in the very best way. So as most of you know, dad was a serial entrepreneur and I have inherited some of those genes. So while I was in college, he was an adjunct professor teaching an evening class in entrepreneurship there, which Tucker was talking about. I would meet him after class and we'd grab dinner together or just talk for a bit about how school was going. This is where I remember really starting to connect with my dad. We even started a business together while I was in college. As adults, we bonded over our shared passion for starting businesses and ideas for companies, swapped corporate war stories, we both had plenty. <laughs> Often I asked for his advice, uh, which anyone who knows him is aware that he loved to give. I employed and parroted many times some of these Everett Keach gems. Don't let the turkeys get you down. So this was his advice many times in my young career in entertainment marketing, working for difficult people. Another one, start it up, but keep your day job. For when I wanted to quit my corporate job and start my own business with no emergency funds set in place. And my favorite, better is the enemy of good enough. For when my perfectionism would get the best of me. I say this to my son, I say it to my clients, uh, my students, and to myself, often better is the enemy of good enough. My father's guidance in business remains a cherished gift. However, I wanna share a story. My dad was really the hardest person to buy gifts for because if he wanted something, he'd just buy it himself. <laughs> so sometimes he'd buy multiples of the thing that he wanted, or even dozens. Recently, when he was searching for something in my dad's office, my husband Jeff found Ziploc bags of USB drives, plus stacks of wireless keyboards and drawers full of computer mice. So if you need any, come see me after. We have plenty. Uh, dad loved going to Micro Center and Wayne and getting the newest gadgets and technology. It was kind of a family joke. Where's dad? Oh, he probably went to Micro Center. It's a computer store in Wayne. Because he pretty much had everything he needed, Christmas shopping for dad was always a challenge. Um, so about 10 years ago, I came up with an idea for something I knew that he couldn't buy for himself. Homemade cookies on demand. So being the marketing person that I was, I crafted the concept of the magic cookie tin, which was Simply, a metal Nestle Toll House branded cookie jar filled with homemade cookies by me to be refilled anytime just by presenting me with the empty tin. My turnaround time was usually within a week. So as you can imagine, he was absolutely delighted by this gift. This became my annual Christmas gift for dad, and he was always excited to receive the special Christmas cookies we'd bake. It was a really great way to keep us connected. And once he became old enough to bake, Evan, my son, and I would bake the cookies together and deliver them to Grandpa. And these are some of my most cherished memories with my son. Now Evan bakes a lot on his own, and if I don't say myself, so myself, he really has the cookie baking gene. So after we share stories today at the reception, be sure to try some of Evan's and my cookies. All 200 out there were baked by us in honor of dad. So aside from baked goods, we also connected over personal finance and investing. As some of you know, I'm a um, accredited financial counselor. That's what I do now, particularly after I changed careers. He even started taking my advice, which really meant a lot. If you knew my dad, he, you recall he usually had plenty of his own to offer. What I'll cherish most and remember is this connection along with the love, support, and guidance that he gave me. In his later days, 
he opened up more about his emotions and gratitude for family. He told me how proud he was of his grandsons, Evan and Lucas, and the amazing young men that they're growing into. He also shared his pride and appreciation for all his family and friends that showed up for him. But above all, he shared with me his love and appreciation for mom and her loyalty for 60 years. This would have been their 60th anniversary in November of this year. For her selfless nature, her big heart, and her patience. And for all of you here today, thank you for being here as we remember and celebrate my dad. Your presence means so much, not just to me, but to all of us as we honor his memory together. Thanks so much. I think we will carry on the conversations in the reception afterwards. I know we have many, many memories to share. Uh, we'll, let that, we'll let that be the last of this part of the service, but please join us for the reception afterwards. After my closing words, I will be escorting the family out into the atrium. You're welcome to join us across the atrium into the fireside room where there are sandwiches, refreshments, and yes, cookies. Lots of cookies. I close with these words from George Eliot, otherwise known as Marianne Evans. Oh, may I join the choir invisible of those immortal dead who live again, in minds made better by their presence, live in pulses stirred to generosity, in deeds of daring rectitude, in scorn for miserable aims that end with self, in thoughts sublime that pierce the night like stars, and with their mild persistence urge our search to vaster issues. So to live is heaven, to make the undying music of the world, breathing as beauteous order that controls the growing sway of the growing life for all. We do inherit that sweet purity. And so we say goodbye for now, and we wish Ev only blue skies. So may it be, and amen. This concludes our service. <laughs>